see time and time again that doctors will see a kid with uh, very high blood sugars and they and they will ask the kid to test for ketones. The kid sees ketones and then the doctor will give the kid a lot of carbohydrate and a lot of insulin to try to flush the ketones. Can you talk about that strategy? And uh, It's not a strategy that I would pursue. Uh, ketones per se are not harmful. What's harmful is the complex of dehydrating events that go along with ketoacidosis. Uh, usually these kids are vomiting or have diarrhea or have both vomiting and diarrhea, have very high blood sugars and therefore are peeing away uh, glucose in their urine and peeing away a lot of water. Plus they have ketones and they're peeing away the ketones. Uh, so they're losing fluid from a number of orifices and that dehydration can kill them and it can and it can kill them rapidly so they need two things they need normal blood sugars and they need rehydration and uh, uh, aside from my patients who rarely have such high blood sugars but sometimes get sick and are vomiting and so on uh, most patients need to go to the hospital for intravenous saline plus insulin to get their blood sugars down. And getting the blood sugars down will also get rid of the ketones, but the ketones are not the main culprit. The main culprit is dehydration. Learning about the amount of ketones is not going to change my mode of treatment which is going to be to keep your blood sugars normal and keeping and keep you rehydrated. So comment on the, the strategy that we always hear where doctors give carbohydrate like a sugar water, like a Gatorade, or and or give a glucose IV, not a saline IV, and then give lots of insulin to deal with the key to flush the ketones. All I can say is that th this is harmful. The, uh, the ketones aren't the culprit. The dehydration is the cul culprit. If you're going to give glucose and raise the blood sugar, even though you're going to give insulin, uh, there's a time delay between the glucose and the insulin. Plus, most doctors don't know how much insulin to give for a certain amount of glucose. And therefore, you're getting the blood sugar even higher and causing more dehydration. So the glucose... And it's the dehydration, severe dehydration, that is dangerous to the brain. So you, you have some kid coming into an ER and a doctor is going to give them glucose IV. If they're coming into the ER, they're in, if they're in DKA or, or dehydrated and near DKA, what can happen? Interestingly enough, if you're... Uh, if you get dehydrated enough, the brain can actually swell. Uh, these kids frequently die of cerebral edema, and it's it's from the dehydration. You you don't find ketone poisoning in the brain. Uh, the brain uh, can live off of ketones uh, when uh, it's not getting adequate glucose because you need insulin to get glucose into cells um, uh, it can live off of ketones so uh, doctors are looking in the wrong direction they're uh, not adequately addressing the dehydration and high blood sugar I have seen a plot that shows the probability of DKA versus HbA1c that was gathered from a large database and it shows that the probability of DKA goes virtually to zero when normal blood sugars are attained by the diabetic and it goes up in a linear fashion basically as A1C increases. Why is that? As A1C increases, you're encountering people who are following standard guidelines eating more and more carbohydrate, 
taking large doses of insulin, which are unpredictable in their effect, and getting unpredictable blood sugars. Whereas the people who are on low carbohydrate diets and getting small doses of insulin, we're talking, remember, about type ones only, um, uh, don't have wild fluctuations. So the more carbohydrate, the more insulin, the wilder the fluctuations, the more likely you're gonna go off the off at the uh, high end with ketoacidosis. Uh, that's how simple it is. It seems sort of obvious, uh, but uh, I guess uh, one could say doctors can be simple-minded.